Facebook. We are la- we are, you know what if what if we what if we did the whole show and we just talked like the thing about the Facebook the Facebook the Facebook he, she says we're live we're live now we're live on www <laughs> dot Facebook that that my dad my dad says wait 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 tell me again the address w w w <laughs> hey everyone it's z dog and marty mccary marty as you guys know best-selling author blah 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 johns hopkins surgeon fighting with jama for another publication just dealing with the, the we're winning we're winning now. we are winning slowly but surely get up in there so marty. we're at the at the jpm having a blast meeting cool people meeting cool people and we brought one of them over here his name is chris jones and he is Hi here there. He's one of the few people that does not make me want to vomit at the JPM. Thank you. So this is why Thank you. Chris is on the show. Because people are like, wait, you brought a venture capitalist on the show. Didn't just yesterday, you and Marty rail and rant about how you know venture is not Sorry. funding things that matter, is not funding um, uh, things that actually affect clinical outcomes for patients and and caregivers because they need this many millions in revenue and they need it to be disposable and they need it to be you know monetizable and blah 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 and then i met chris we met chris at the university of vermont talk that both marty and i did thanks for coming out there oh it was a dude vermont people don't realize it is the tiniest population on earth and yet feels so important and big. You pack a punch. You really do. <laughs> like downtown Burlington, I was like, there's all this Bernie uh, stuff everywhere and then you go eat and the food is tremendous. Did you have good food when you were there? Yeah, I um, f- lost Farm a few uh, fingers from frostbite and then I was able to still eat my food. And, <laughs> and that was, was in July. <laughs> It was, was it's cold november i think right yeah 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 it was cold it was cool so so chris uh, hit me up after that talk and was like look uh i should tell you about what hospital venture is it's a new thing it's only about three years old and it's the way that healthcare can take back this idea that you need capital to do things sure. you need capital to innovate but shouldn't clinicians and clinically relevant things be funded and when you go to jp morgan and all this stuff all you're seeing is like well what's the next you know big thing and then there's these all these small guys that are never going to get funded and are doing things that aren't even relevant yes who knows what's relevant people who touch patients every day and so how, how do you think about what is hospital venture why should we care about it why should we not hate you sure yeah well, thank you for this and it's good to have that anti-emetic property of uh, not <laughs> causing vomit um but quite frankly or we, diarrhea or diarrhea or, right yeah. <laughs> we have a very important mission which is to invest in technologies that would otherwise die on the vine that patients need and our frustration that kind of led to an investment in venture capital, essentially an investment into these uh, directly into these technologies, came from frustration from early doctorpreneurs, if you will, mm-hmm. who had a lot of trouble finding conventional venture capital. So the typical venture arms that go to these conferences uh, and pay the two thousand dollars a night for a hotel that yeah. also goes into your uh, healthcare bill. That is what yeah. it costs for a hotel here in San Francisco. It is. Yes. And actually, Chris showed us a, a picture. The Marriott had something posted in their like uh, a little crappy little restaurant they have there, and it said minimum fee for a table one hundred and twenty five. That was in the lounge, I think. Yes, you can't even uh, sit. It in was the lounge. astounding. I wanted a coffee, and I estimated it. I mean, I'm only a health economist, but I estimated <laughs> it would cost two hundred fifty dollars. You know, essentially to have two of us at that table, and it was like per person. I think was a fee. That is yeah. absurd. And it's all coming out of our healthcare dollars. I think eventually it goes into what we're spending on healthcare, and that's one of the big problems. So the frustration that led to this beautiful endeavor, which is to invest into early stage technologies on behalf of our hospital that patients need, came from doctors who were finding a hard time in getting their ideas out there, getting their companies funded, Mm -hmm. and being able to hire accordingly in order to bring their companies swiftly to market. So we put wind in the sails of entrepreneurs. We've made a number of investments, and it goes down to our mission, which is, comes down to our mission, which is investing in the future of healthcare in a way that focuses on the patient, reduces costs, and affects the wider community we serve. So we're a not-for-profit six-hospital system in Vermont. Uh, We're very small, as you know, with 640,000 people, but we have real problems Uh, real challenges with our population in terms of access to care. uh, I think we're doing much better uh, in terms of... But but on this model, Mm. I mean, it's basically turning venture capital upside down because it's the hospital or the healthcare organization investing in what their doctors and nurses want to do 
differently with their patients. So it's sort of a homegrown investment model. It is. Which is totally different from the typical investment model. How, how is that different? Yes. Explain to me, because I'm a dummy. Sure. So first of all, the return on investment is secondary to our mission. So, so mission is primary. Mission is primary. Focusing on the patients is primary. Making sure that we invest in technologies that are going to help uh, our healthcare system now and sustainably in the future, that's our priority. Um, so we want, to, we want to basically enable the little guy and the little lady uh, who may be struggling to get their early capital will go at risk okay, to help them out. And we also focus on technologies drugs, devices, uh, scheduling software, and so on, where we can be helpful as a customer of those technologies. Oh, because you're also potentially the customer. We're potentially the customer. And I've walked in the, tr I've been in the trenches uh, with my own uh, company when I was a professor at the University of Vermont. Uh, so I founded a company called Truster.us, where, where we focused on understanding the voice of the patient in their own words. I founded this with the former dean of our medical school, and I understand how hard it is to find early capital. So all of those learnings kind of went into doing what I do. I'm proud to say there are now at least 18 hospital systems doing this. It's relatively new, and there's something called the Strategic Ventures Group where we all gather together, not for $125 a plate, but on very slim pickings, and uh, we're able to help each other and, and share uh, lessons learned, so Cleveland Clinic and um, Mount Sinai and Partners and uh, Providence and OSF and all these different hospital systems are now catching on to this. We should be participants in the innovation process. Well, so let me ask a question. So what would you invest in a technology or a startup that's sole goal is to disrupt hospitals and put them out of business? Yeah, well, we, we understand the future of healthcare is going to be very different to how it is today. So we are invested in telemedicine. Um, in terms of investing you know, to our own detriment, um, I, I don't think it's really going to be that. I think it's more going to be investing into the new shape of healthcare. Mm -hmm. And that's going to include helping to get into the patient's home, helping to understand their voice in their own words, helping to follow them on their healthcare journey. One of the things that uh, was very interesting that I learned uh, the, uh, yesterday uh, uh, from the founder of one of the largest uh, artificial heart companies, okay, Dr. Don Hill, he shared with me that heart failure patients have an early sign of not doing well, and that early sign is they're not checking their mail. Oh, so interesting! Because you, you got to walk out to the mailbox, and you're mailbox. huffing and puffing, and you can New York, uh, you know, class three heart failure. Well, by that definition, I think both of us would be uh, <laughs> basically in the ICU right now because I think I've checked my mail twice last year. <laughs> yeah, but you, you, yeah, you check it's it because proxy. of you know, other mental illness that allow that <laughs> prevents you from being organized. And but, yeah, I guess for, so for these guys because of their edema, because of their shortness of breath, they're 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 not checking. And so, so what else did he say? Well, he said that there are a number of these nuances that should be captured. So he's helping us with that company I mentioned to actually address these real issues that occur outside of the hospital in so, patients' own homes. So the company Truster that you're working on. Yeah. So how would you do that? Uh, so what we would do essentially is to analyze voice uh, through cough recognition, the syntax of words, how people say something, what they describe. They might describe that um, that they had trouble getting up in the morning. They might have um, talked about their bathroom issues with a chat bot. So you have another layer of privacy that can be sifted for relevant information, but is non-creepy. And that, uh, we're, we understand, is an important component to building trust in the doctor-patient dyad. So, so does, this, does this technology then listen in in their home or something? Or how does We this hope work? it will someday. Right? Yeah. Because everything's that's listening. Our iPhones yeah. are listening to us. Our yeah, Alexa well, are listening sure. to us. Our cars will listen to us. And I want to embrace that technology and use it for good. Um, yeah. This is using artificial intelligence uh, at the highest level uh, in the simplest form, which is text. So many people are deleting apps. They don't want another app. Nobody wants another app, right? And we kind of create that invisibly with a complex back end that's able to address the needs of patients on the front end. And we feel that Truster is going to lead to uh, very important uh, steps in the years ahead. So a company like that, you don't think would get uh, standard venture investment in the current climate? Uh, we had a hard time mm. finding any investment. So we bootstrapped this, as many Vermonters do, uh, funding it ourselves, getting some early wins, getting some early uh, customers. And now we're in talks with Stanford Research, with Meraki Innovations in Boston, um, with a number of the top pharma companies, including Abbott. So I'm very excited about how this might uh, help 
it's not going, there's no one size fits all, but this may help understand patients in their own words. Yeah. What was the hashtag that Amy uh, Baxter came up with yesterday? Hashtag Tenora. There is no one right answer. Yeah. Which I'm going to steal. She yeah. also said something else interesting, which is pain is the body's opinion of how safe you are. Yes. Which I thought was interesting. Yeah. But uh, re so relating to Amy Baxter, so here's. Uh, <clears throat> a female doctor, yeah, passionate about an issue. We talked with her yesterday live on the show where you're sitting right now, and she talked about how difficult it was for her to give up the control to ask for venture money when it wasn't a product. They wanted to make it disposable. They had all these preconditions. She couldn't go publicly speak about stuff the way she can now. I mean, yes. how do you guys deal with these things as a smaller, more nimble, more clinically oriented? Yes. sort of a f source of funding. Yeah, it's certainly a challenge. Uh, we're changing the direction of a freight train because for decades, doctors have been told you have to practice medicine and you should not be involved in business and in innovation. And yet, of course, without innovation, you don't have progress in terms of technologies and, and uh, curative and, and, and uh, uh, therapeutic advances and so on. So we feel that this is a very important um, I would call it frame shift in the way healthcare is finally embracing innovation. And that is calling it a doctorpreneur or a pharmapreneur, as the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy has called it, um, embracing innovation and safeguarding time for, for already highly strained physicians uh, to be able to innovate and to be able to create their own companies and bring those to commercial success. I like that doctorpreneur, nursepreneur. Yeah. Artpreneur. 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 Surgeonpreneur. Housekeeperpreneur. How about nephropreneur? Oh, I like that. A fake, a fake <laughs> kidney. Well, so here, here's an. <laughs> <laughs> People go, are so creative who go into healthcare at every level, right? I mean, sure. You name it. Every level of medicine. People go in with this incredible creativity. And it's almost like we beat that creativity out of them and we tell them, no, you have an idea. There's no vehicle for you to express that. Just keep it to yourself. Oh, isn't that interesting? You may present a horrible PowerPoint at a national conference <laughs> saying, here's what we could do in the future. But you're actually harnessing this energy within your own health system yes. and around the country. Yes. saying we're interested in clinicians and what their ideas. Exactly, not only interested in that, we, we want to foster um, a much closer interaction between physicians and between institutions. So I mentioned that there are now 18 hospitals part of this group and we're able to powwow over the latest and greatest and help uh, put wind in the sails of entrepreneurs. What percent of the 18 are profitable right now? I'm not sure, uh, uh, but I will get back to you on that. Interesting. I would say that there's a, um, certainly there are for-profit and, and not-for-profit arms. The ones that are most effective in this whole relationship are the not-for-profit institutions uh, because we have a, a tighter bottom line and we see that this is an important area to uh, invest in technologies uh, that can that can help the populations we serve. Well, so this is an interesting thing because when we think about not-for-profit healthcare, we, you know, me and Marty will both say, well, that whole thing's a scam because it's just taking the same profits, making it tax exempt, not paying property tax, still suing your patients when they don't pay the bills, and then taking the money and either paying executives or building a new wing of the hospital. So now I don't say this to attack your institution or any not-for-profits, although I kind of do, not your institution because you guys are dope and had us come speak, but really because, <laughs> Talk about conflict of interest. But really because here is an interesting angle, and you can respond to any of that, but here's an interesting angle. You're taking the potential profit that you've made by doing good in the world, hopefully taking care of patients, and reinvesting it in groups of clinicians that are doing things that are gonna make things better. I couldn't think of a better use of that money. Building another wing, paying an executive bonus is not it but investing back in the innovation that's gonna make your mother and your kids have better lives, that that actually means something. Do you see it that way or what, what are your thoughts on it? I this? see it that way without the profit part because of course we're not for profit. So I have a very hard time carving out the slim, on the slimmest pickings a tiny bit of budget relative to everything else that has to go on in terms of But couldn't that be true of a, a for-profit as well? I mean, I honestly don't know the difference between a non-for-profit and a for-profit on the ground in America today, except that a non-for-profit doesn't have to pay taxes. 
Now, traditionally, charities are more loosely managed, right? Mm. Oh, let's not hire, let's not fire Bob over there. He's a nice guy. He's been through a lot. He's friends with so-and-so who's a donor. So they just tend not to be run as tightly as a for-profit, obviously, with the fire under the butt of having to report to a board and shareholders. So I, I don't even know what the difference is. I don't even know if it matters, except that if you claim, as we've said, if you claim that you provide community benefit to get that tax exempt status, there should be some community benefit. Sure. And suing the crap out of patients probably violates that community pub- uh, benefit. I would agree. Are yeah. hospitals sitting on gobs of cash? They're just looking for places <clears throat> to spend it? To deploy it? I think some are and some are not. I mean, certainly we're not. Uh, I'd, I'd like for us to have far more resources to be able to invest in innovation, right? So. Uh, I'm very pleased to see the fruits of our labor, very pleased to see some of the things that we've invested in. I can give you some real examples, and this is not a commercial plug-in, but we invested into a technology uh, in collaboration with the University of Maryland. Uh, some UVM alums who went to the NIH created a company that, uh, that has a technology that can potentially be curative for heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and type 1 diabetes. So we felt that that really served our mission. We invested in another one uh, led by Dr. Jeffrey Hausfeld called Biofactora, which is in the biodefense space, right? And they are bringing in, they're manufacturing smallpox vaccines. Why do we need smallpox vaccines? I think it's pretty obvious in the current state of affairs. Yeah, interesting. So here's a question that I think, <clears throat> if I'm representing my audience, there's a lot of hospital workers and they're gonna say, well, if you have this money, why are we not reinvesting it in staffing and in you know, equipment and you know, in uh, better, better uh, ratios, things like that? Nursing I mean, how, pay. Nursing pay, sure. how do you think about that? So we want to have an accretive uh, return on our portfolio so that we can do just that, so that we have more money available to be able to pro- provide for the staff that we need. So if you get a 10X return on an investment or something, or a 60x return on an sure. investment, that money then has to, because you're not for profit, has to go back into, is that true? Is that Well, how in works? terms of the mechanics, <clears throat> uh, that's still being worked out. I mean, this is so new for everyone. Mm. Uh, that would be a good problem to have. We haven't had such a 50 time return, but the little returns that we have had have proven the model that innovation is sustainable in terms of being able to, again, get the patient return, as well as hopefully make it commercially viable. So Don Pulliam says, and this is really a question for you, so haven't surgeons been creating their own instruments for a century? It it advanced medicine until it got to be too much red tape to get it approved. So I wonder if... Most surgical instruments were developed by surgeons. Yeah, yeah. I mean, tissue staplers, uh, energy devices. I mean, these are homegrown innovations that now there's no vehicle, really, if you have an idea, to get it out there. And we'll see something like a new NG tube, and we'll be like, yeah, I had that idea, but nobody asked me. Ah, interesting. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, so that's why I like what what, what he's doing. What he's doing, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and insurance is, companies mm. are getting into this business too. They are sitting on gobs of cash, like most businesses, and they're realizing, hey, let's have a healthcare venture arm. And so I met somebody from an insurance company, and I said, oh, wow. oh what do you, you know, what what do you do at the insurance company? Oh, I run their investment venture arm where he goes around meeting with companies and figures out who to invest in. And universities have been doing this forever, and you know it. it they it's, have with, yeah. with varying success. Right. So it's been really hard to get technologies through uh, offices of tech and commercialization, and ultimately to uh, commercial success. And many would say that some of these technologies have either failed too early or have been exploited um, by big companies uh, for IP that should really have been kept in house within the university. Mm. And we're still trying to figure that out because we want physicians to be and nurses and the entire healthcare staff to be creative and to embrace innovation. And I think if we lose sight of that, we're going to lose a major valuable component of the traditional healthcare system. It would, it would be really cool if you're working in a hospital, you're a resident or something, you have a cool idea, like tomorrow we're gonna have Pelu on the show. He's like a Stanford medical student for 10 years because he's been, oh, he started Augmetics and then he did this and he did that and it's like, He's hustling for venture money outside of the hospital system. Imagine if you could just go to your program director and go, hey, can you hook me up with Chris Jones? Because because I got to pitch him on this thing that we're thinking about doing. We need some seed money. We'd rather it come from the hospital because then some of the benefit can come to my institution, which I care about. And I'm going to earmark it to to 
force you guys to staff, uh, you know, better nursing ratios or something. You know, like yeah. there's something in the contract, right? <laughs> and you do good by you do well by doing good in the world and that sort of thing. Yeah, it should be a win-win, and I think it it is going to become a win-win. <clears throat> Um, but there's so much innovation out there, right? We're inundated with some beautiful ideas. And I would say the earliest stage things are the best opportunities. And yet those are the ones that are most overlooked. The traditional venture capital here on the West Coast are invested into the Ubers and Lyfts and WeWorks. And we've seen where those go, the Airbnbs and Bs and so on. And 75 or more percentage of those ridiculous valued companies are not profitable. <laughs> so how can that be a commercial success? There must be value to them. I enjoy taking Uber and so on. So I'm not, you know, uh, pointing fingers at one or the other. But I just feel in the grand scheme of things, why should we not be invested into things that have real tangible value for our patients? So didn't he just nail, Marty, why we get so itchy at JPM? Yeah, I mean, a company's not profitable, yet all these people are getting very rich off of it. Yeah. <laughs> so A. B, it's maybe it's not adding any value to the world. <laughs> and and yet, you know, like last night, okay, so now we're gonna get kitchen confidential here, all right? We're going from event to event to event at JPM. And I'll go to an event, and of course, you know, occasionally I'll get recognized as, you know, this Z-Dog clown that does this stuff on the internet. And so people come and pitch me, like I'm some kind of multi-billionaire investor, right? I'm like, I I'm pitching you. Would you like to sponsor the show? And 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 they'll say, well, okay, so this is what we're doing. I'm, I'm doing fun. a, um, I'm very involved in telehealth. I'm <laughs> extremely involved in telehealth. And uh, what I'd like to do is really make telehealth something accessible. And uh, so we're, we have this app, and the app does telehealth. So what do you think, man? Yeah. Can I be on your show? And I'm thinking, we joked about that. So <laughs> we thought, what does a laser stand for? Many people don't know what that is. Light, light waiting, right? Yeah. So I thought of just kind of in longhand writing, I'll, this is my business pitch and I'm going to create this and we'll call it a laser. <laughs> and probably we'd raise $10 million on the West Coast. On the East Coast, we're much more conservative, right? So we do a, a tremendous amount of diligence in collaboration with physicians, nurses, and entire healthcare staff to make sure, and in, patients in the loop, to make sure that what we're invested in is going to be of value. We need a startup police for the JPM conference. I agree. So when you Could say, not agree more. hey, what does your startup do? And they say, oh, our goal is to turn healthcare upside down using data analytics for the betterment of patients. <laughs> yeah. They should be issued a ticket and be told get, you are never to tased. say that again. Get tased in the neck. Get tased. And you know, start a police, arrest this man. He wants me to develop his app. It's stupid as F and, oh man, that's amazing. That's a song right there. I mean, no, but it's really true. It's it. really true. You get, you get, and the thing is people have good intentions, Yes. but I'll tell you this. A lot of them are clinicians that are, they're seeing the writing on the wall, they're burning out, they're suffering moral injury, they can't continue to see patients the way they are. So they're like, what if I make an app that does something that I think I'd wanna see done in my office? They don't realize yeah. that 20 other people have maybe tried this, that it's not a scalable thing, that it maybe doesn't solve the problem they think they do. And that's one of the troubles with doctorpreneurs is yes. we're not that business savvy. Mm -hmm. So we may have a great idea, but we do need partners and collaborators that know what the hell they're doing. And Dr. I, D, would it, would it make sense if I shared with you some of the themes that I'm seeing for what would be highly investable and highly valuable to patients? Mark, would that be very... I, I, I like that, but yeah. also, you know, for the students and residents and young doctors out there, nurses, people that are interested in general in yeah. this type of thing and yeah. what they can do, this is a great conference, as much as we brag on yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, this is where big ideas happen and you meet people like Chris, who can empower those ideas. So, so you know, get, stop going to the, the regular PowerPoint conferences of medicine or reduce that by one conference. You know, my colleagues may go to six of these typical medical conferences a year. And instead of going, you know, I'm cutting out, for example, no offense to my friends there, the pancreas club meeting. Okay. <laughs> I've decided. That's very niche. I, I love it. <laughs> I really enjoy it. The people there are wonderful. I get yeah. my t-shirt every year, although some people think it looks like a penis. <laughs> I love my Pancreas Club t-shirt. But that is one meeting. You can do it at Alcatraz and cut. say, 
a senior cell. <laughs> I, had decided, I decided to cut that one meeting and add in the JPM healthcare you, conference. Why, why does the Pancreas Club sound like a John Hughes 80s film? Like Molly Ringwald sitting there and she's just got epigastric pain <laughs> and after after hours in detention. But so, so Chris, you were saying, because relating to what Marty's saying, yeah. You're trying to advise people, like, here are the themes that actually you're Thank interested you. in are mattering. Yeah, yeah. Like, what is that? Sure. No, it, it, the themes, I think, are ABCs right now. AI, blockchain, and cyber. God help us. If I hear any of those things again, I'm going to die. And I'll tell you why. Those are all yeah. trigger words. They are they trigger words. <laughs> they are trigger words, but they're very important. So I turn the table, I just flip the table AI over. AI is, is so important <laughs> because we can just, we can use our analytical capacities to learn from conversations, as mentioned earlier, or from the doctor-patient experience, or from all sorts of wearable uh, data. Inputs. Wearables another trigger word. Wearables are another trigger word. Blockchain is uh, is going to be coming into the dist whole distributed. Yeah, what is it mean? Plain English. Yeah, what is a blockchain? An yeah. immutable ledger. Uh, that a, in, a, in a distributed way, you're able to kind of figure out that A, I am who I say I am, and B, what I've done has been authenticated. So it's basically just that. And cyber, I can't talk too much about cyber because it's so important. Bio cyber is massive. The biggest uh, breaches in the next five years are going to be in the healthcare systems and they're going to be in pharma and our health data is at, are at risk. I oh. see. So cyber in the sense of security. security. And, you know, I spoke at the, I forget the name of the conference, but it's the big cybersecurity conference. Sure. And uh, talked about what we were doing at our clinic and, and this sort of thing. And it was really interesting. Those guys are, they're all like, you know, a, a little, the IT like software guys. But when you talk about the why of yes. what they're doing, they start to light up. Everybody sure. wants a purpose to apply their passion yeah. to, right? And so we, and then this, this came up yesterday with Amy because she was kind of ragging. I was watching the clip back <laughs> and she was like, no, no, I wouldn't vilify venture capitalists. I mean, they are doing what they're good at. We need to make what they're good at apply to us. And I thought that was actually pretty smart. And that's what, like you're, that. that's what you're doing. That's what we're doing. Right. Yeah. And back on the, on the cyber thing for just one second, yeah, yeah. it seems like we're always reactionary to cyber. And only after there's a privacy Pearl Harbor the people open their eyes and say, oh, you know, we have a problem. A privacy but pro harm. Well, the, the startup Is that still folks, relevant? It should be. <laughs> when you're trying Never to make forget. A, when you're trying to make a lot of money with, in a startup, cyber is not a priority, right? Yeah. When, when yeah. Lyft is making their app and Uber is yeah. making their yeah. app, are they investing in high-level cybersecurity at that or in those early stages? I hope so. Not, well, they, we hope so, yeah. but the reality is a lot of people that are struggling in early they're you know trying to manage their cash burn and they're trying to basically get through and survive so it's managing long it's like kids and long term health risks yes they just don't you know they figure i'm going to table that for a little bit later yeah and they invest in bits and bytes of information um, or kind of these the next gadget that's going to help us with cyber the next software the widget the widget yeah. and yet human behavior is the biggest cause of yeah. breach for example Zdog MD, your password has expired. Please come up with another password. <laughs> it cannot be one of the passwords you used in the last 347 passwords. Zdog number one. Zdog number one is now Zdog number 1,012, right? And and uh, so he, yeah, you're right. Humans are the weak link. By the way, Don Pulliam again with a good comment. Medical conferences should be more idea generating and collaborative than just staring at a PowerPoint. And Absolutely. include people like Chris there instead of just our own ideas talking to ourselves. Yeah. What way? What if you have Chris come in and, and he's like, you. okay, so here are the companies we're investing in. Have you thought of anything along these lines? If so, you might be able to, A, get rich doing something good for the world. Get rich meaning survive in this day and age. That's a good point. And keep it in an ecosystem of the clinical medicine that you love and you've dedicated your life to. Because I think that's one of the things that a lot, a lot of clinicians feel bad. They've really been taught not to just, to, we're altruistic, we give up our 20s, we do all this, and it's not about making money and this and that. And so, the, but the idea is like like Amy Baxter, like, do you get the sense she's out there to get rich? She'd absolutely not. Yeah. Right. But the thing is, she ought to do well financially if she does good in the world and works really hard and it executes really well. So we ought to be teaching people how to do that because then she doesn't have to see patients all day to support her ability to make sure. a product. Yeah. Well, and, and hopefully those returns can be brought back into uh, mindful, successful entrepreneurs who can then invest in the innovations of the future, right? That's the whole circuit that we're hoping for. You said mindful. Have you guys thought about investing in these sort of technologies and apps that enable more introspective mindfulness and those sort of well-being strategies? Absolutely. 
but they have to have data behind them. That's the so hard that's, part. That's the key thing, yeah. and also suicide prevention. So we we are looking at hmm. we're in the advanced discussions now with a company that I think has really nailed um, a real pain point, which is that twenty military uh, background people take their own lives every single day. Yeah, uh, It's a major problem heart. of our society and we want to solve that. Yeah. Um, and it's going to take more than one app or more than one technology. Mm-hmm. But I think putting those a few of those together will go a long way. And if we save one life, it, the whole thing is worth it. And let's even bring it closer to home. Physicians, nurses, hugely high suicide rates. Yes. Um, you actually told a story even before you came on about your own interaction with suicide. And, and, the, and the thing is, this is something that uh, we have to address collectively. We talk about it all the time, but without actual solutions, right? And some sure. of it is rebuilding societal cohesion and you know, dealing with isolation and loneliness we were talking about the other day. Mm-hmm. If we can start to address those things, and I don't think it's an app and I don't think it's a sure. widget, it's, a, it's, an, a, it's an approach. Maybe someone will come up with a technology that helps us, but. Yeah, uh, well I can share what uh, my dear friend who took his own life as a physician, very successful uh, physician, uh, Jeffrey Baggish, told me, which was he was also um, using pain pills, prescribed pain pills, but he said he was addicted not to a pill, but to the cessation of pain. That is so important and, and important. so under understood by the public. So the, uh, even a lot of my followers- Rest his soul. Rest his soul, are very vindictive about addiction. They feel that it is this personal failing and people are there to get, they're trying to get high and they're doing all that. They don't understand that the so many of them are treating a deep, pain and yes. until we recognize what that is and it's an individual right but until we recognize it we, we're never going to solve this problem yes because that's why like okay look marty if you end up trying a percocet your post-op whatever maybe the chances you're not going to become dependent on it but what if i have this deep pain and i for the first time and i've heard the said people take the pill and they go for the first time i wasn't in pain i'm not talking about physical pain yes i i felt neutral yes how addictive would that be to feel normal again right yeah. so so this is this is crucial and so this was in a company you were in this was in this was in a, a, a previous work environment that i was in and uh, it actually prompted me to move to vermont uh, where i have a great work-life balance but we also play into that thematic right of treating drugs misuse where in vermont we have some of the highest drugs misusing rates in the country largely due to our small population, but for all the usual circumstances, Is it social rural, determinants of health, social rural, yeah. and, 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 and people need uh, work, and there's a lot of uh, insecurity uh, around uh, all sorts of things, uh, family dynamics, um, and then just our position relative to Canada and other kind of hot roads and so on. Are you blaming Canada like we, South Park? We... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we invested into Aspendi Health, which is um, focused on the so- on social determinants of health and drug testing, and they're a second choice, a second chance employer, right? So drug misusers users will 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 be cured that's so hard. and not, then yeah, work for the company. Work. So this is something that we be, uh, believe very highly in. So, so you guys are investing in this kind yes. of because see that's it's almost like a social uh, investment fund, right? Where the, the <clears throat> what are what are the metrics of your performance? In other words, it, let's say you invest in ten great companies that are doing terrific things, yes, and they're helping patients, but at the end of two years, there's not quite the returns that say a board, your board may may be looking for. Um, is that okay? Are they mission-minded enough to think, say, hey, we're yeah. going after impact and yeah. it's okay, the returns aren't there? Absolutely. Or is Chris going to be asking me for a job? I may be. We don't want to lose money. That's, that's very East Coast of us. We don't want to lose money and we and it's hard to put too much at risk. But by and large, we're focused on the mission more than ROI. Have you ever so seen... To meet the mission, that's our metric. Have you ever seen people use a term besides innovation? Like... Is that a trigger word for you? Yeah, it's less of a trigger word than than cyber or a Bitcoin or, or a blockchain. blockchain. How about yeah. invention? I mean, do people still talk about inventions? Yeah, or they don't it? enough. I like invention. I like creativity. Creativity. I feel I've got children, and my children, um, I think, within our household, are really encouraged to be creative, to think differently about real problems. And you know, when a kid is two years old, they draw a picture that no one has ever seen before. And by the time we're 15, we're kind of jumping into convention around what a house should look like or a person should look like. And I, I think we could do very well to learn from our kids. And the answer is also psychedelics. High dose psychedelics, Marty. Like Some of those are approved. Five grams, yeah, actually Colorado, I think. And the, actually, all joking aside, so in Hopkins and other places, they're doing studies on psychedelics for and treating pharma, addiction. What, who? I think one of the pharma companies has found uh, new uses, like approved uses, 
for what were otherwise kind of party uh, right party drugs right well it's interesting because you know the the argument from the conspiracy minded stoners man is that pharma will never do this because it'll put pharma out of business they don't understand how the world works okay every tool appropriate for the problem and so maybe these old uh re so-called recreational drugs have have a use under guided circumstances with clinicians and so on right but it has to be put to rigorous scientific you have to testing ta you have right to same study with cannabis it. and all of these um you know very important th there could be some very important indications that um that these drugs serve or that um uh can be treated uh, effectively, but it has to be put to clinical trials. Is cannabis legal in Vermont now? Uh, it, it, it is to some extent, right? Uh, I believe for prescribed purposes. I see, but it's not. I don't right. think it's criminalized. I see, because you know, I've re I've reviewed the data on cannabis for medical purposes, and really, there's only three indications. I didn't know there were three. I thought there was only one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's only three things where it shows um, reasonable benefit. We Glaucoma. did coma. So it was not even glaucoma was listed. It was it was uh, cancer or chemotherapy related uh, nausea. nausea yeah. I think neuropathic uh, pain, and those particular seizure disorders in kids, those particular genetic seizure disorders that, that a couple of different variants of it. And those are yeah. things that have been studied really well. Everything else is kind of anecdote or observational studies or something. Absolutely. So the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy, the oldest school of pharmacy in our country, <coughs> which created the term pharmapreneur has created and launched the first master's program to focus on the science of cannabis and cannabinoids. That's and I think great. it's very valuable. That's great. That's yeah. great. I mean, it, it basically has anti-inflammatory properties that you see in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. So there's probably a lot of other applications clinically for something with anti-inflammatory properties, recognizing, of course, there, there can be some downsides to it sure. and and again which compounds and how do we study it and yeah. there's so much religion and psychological baggage around the compound people treat it as as this the, the best thing that's ever happened to them and then others are very concerned and have you know cannabis hysteria or what do they used to call it weed um what was it reefer madness and uh so somewhere the truth is somewhere in between so yeah. again to nora there is no one right answer but we do Love have to it. study it and i like the fact that you emphasize studying it because again you're in the clinical space yes and so a study is important we have to rely on science and i think we should also rely on those patient experiences if there are truly patient nuances that are meaningful that should go into the category of real world evidence and not be overlooked so another example of that is um, the space of muscular dystrophy so parents with children who have muscular dystrophy subject the kids to a six minute walk test and the kids fail the walk test and that's kind of a binary endpoint. But if the kid can get into a minivan or doesn't have to jump onto, uh, sorry, doesn't have to be carried between one bed and another, that could be very meaningful to the family. It's not currently captured. So I think those kinds of things we're going to see more of an appreciation for the voice of the patient, the voice of the caregiver. You know, uh, coming from a hospital kind of person, that's very powerful because the patient's stories aren't listened to. And uh, there's an attitude among us, right, where it's like, well, if the data, we studied this, and this is what it is. Well, okay, we studied yeah. it in Northern European men in a narrow population. The study wasn't perfect because our studies aren't perfect. And so maybe some of these anecdotal stories need to be understood in a different way. Maybe we need to revamp our clinical trial process. Maybe yes. we need to look at applying, what were the ABCs? AI, Blockchain, blockchain cyber. and cyber to our clinical trial process so that we yeah. can, you know, uh, obtain synergy at the field level traction. And, and maybe just listen to patients when they say, hey, my ulcerative colitis is managed well with, you know, um, CBD. Right. Maybe we can listen to them instead and, of just ridicule yes. them. And, exactly. Well, I, I'm with you. I, I often fall in the ridiculing any extreme view like, bro, CBD will cure death. And so you have to, well, let's study it. And the other sure. thing is like the supplement industry, and this is something we can do a whole show on, is so under-regulated, under-tested that you never know what's in them. So how are you even going to know what in, in that CBD compound? Is it THC? Because it often it adulters, the psychoactive component, adulters CBD. So then what, what's really helping you? Exactly. It's very dangerous uh, in terms of unregulated or under-regulated um, applications you know, to CBD. So if there truly are... Uh, medicinal qualities and those those really need to be evaluated rigorously and then patients have to be matched to uh to, to i would say highly purified highly studied 
um, highly personalized, formulations. personalized, personalized formulation. Yeah. That's another buzzword. It is a buzzword. Yeah, personalized medicine. Right. Exactly. But it's so. I mean, not to put too fine a point on it. Uh, now um, they say if if you can name a cancer, you can treat it. I think it's a beautiful thing. Mm. Relating to that, how are how are you guys thinking about disrupting? The pharmaceutical industry with your investments are there ways to do that or is it so tightly wound and tightly regulated and off limits so we're doing it oh. um and uh we've invested into a biosimilars company oh. uh, because the cost of very expensive drugs like humira and so on uh, we feel can actually be manufactured to a higher level of purity because of the latest equipment and at a much uh, more affordable price point. Isn't that interesting? So hospitals actually investing in technology that will ultimately yeah. save the money. Intermountain's and the doing this. They're in, sure. in, in a consortium of hospitals that's basically trying to own some generic drug companies. Mm. Um, and I think also- oh, I've heard we, this, yeah. Yeah, and we need some accountability around those companies because from the book Bottle of Lies, which is a great book, um, oh, it's yeah. clear that mm. many of the generic drugs that we as U.S. physicians are prescribing are made with substandard or even horrific conditions overseas. It's in the United States yes. uh, formulary supply. Yeah, there's like the tiers of sweatshop workers in our generic lisinopril or whatever, you know? And we went from surprise inspections to planned inspections, like when Jayco yeah, that's right. says, hey, we're coming in three weeks. That's right, and all, all the nurses put the badges on and take the drink off the nurse's yeah. station. And everyone gets a text page, please welcome the Joint Commission today. <laughs> well, but sometimes, okay, I'll be on good behavior. Sometimes you touch on a very important point, which is sometimes generic drugs can be uh, of a higher purity than their branded alternative. And that's something that we should also be aware of. Wait, is that really true? Uh, it has been shown, in, I believe, in uh, acetaminophen. That, There's yeah. wide variation in <clears throat> the quality of generic drugs and their safety. I mean, there's a case in the United States in the book Bottle of Lies where there was actually a bug discovered inside a pill because some of these conditions are absolutely horrific. A bug and a pill. Yeah, I mean, they've gone to the lowest level where there's like sewage and animals in the in the factory where they make these. So you're telling me we should put that pill on the blockchain? Well, I'm saying, you know, <laughs> why, why not have some great U.S. hospitals managing and owning this process where there's public accountability rather than it being outsourced 15 times to get the lowest possible price point and all these middlemen who are here at JPM making a ton of money along the way. Could it, could it be that... Because I have this belief that our current hospital model is going to fail. And the reason it's going to fail is that we're going to push more things to the outpatient. We're going to try to prevent disease and actually get paid to prevent disease. And hospitals that try to do everything for everyone are going to fail. It's going to be centers of excellence that specialize in something. So could it be that our current hospital model starts to shift to more enablers of health throughout the community? And some of that is investing in things that are actually going to uh, really uh, have outcomes. Some of it is investing in social determinants of health and housing and food security yes. and education. Some of it is investing in physician education and training and better surgical instruments. I mean, I don't know. It's just Absolutely. brainstorming out loud. And we'll, That's exactly where we hope things will go mm. so that we're focused more on preventative care rather than on treating things downstream so, so that patients don't get to heart, to heart failure. Right. So you think hospitals may be on a trajectory to fail. I personally think the quality of the food in American hospital cafeterias will keep people coming. <laughs> And it will keep <laughs> hospitals alive. You we know have what? some very good food. It's all farm to table. Well, you're in the university. Wait, are you come to our hospital for lunch? No, really? really? And subsidized. Are so it's it's actually quite affordable. Is this at the wow. hospital at the or hospital. your venture office? No, it's at the hospital. We don't have a venture. I'm the venture office. This is my venture office. <laughs> have you been to Stanford's new hospital? All the administrative offices are gleaming cubicles, oh. and, the, and the doctors and all the staff have to share one lounge. <laughs> do you have an open office, or do you? I do. My open office what? is uh, pretty much... Uh, I would say JFK, uh, Philadelphia Airport, Burlington yeah, Airport. Yeah, yeah. But I have, an, lot, I have yeah. an open office. But open offices are cool, aren't they? I mean, the WeWork idea, it's like we look at this and it's like, why are we using these cubicles? But here's the thing. Here's the thing, though. Have you, have you, use them. They don't, but have you worked in an open office? Um, I've uh, been to a coffee shop. Does that count? <laughs> If you have a, it's hard to have a conversation. I've, I've in an worked open in open office. office. First of all, you're interrupted constantly. Oh, yeah, you got to run to a lounge. You got to, yeah, you got to find. So that's one of the challenges. So they, they, it sounds great, but then when you do it, you're like, man, I need a space. You guys are killing me. Um, <laughs> you hit on a very important point because we're constantly interrupted all the time. So we live in this laconic world where somebody sends a text message, we need to respond to it immediately. If we don't answer our phone, there's something wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel that one of the things that we'd like to safeguard is some time for doctors and nurses to breathe and think. 
I check. Whoa, I like. I mean, what? <laughs> Wait, you work with a hospital? I, I don't trust this guy. I check my email <laughs> once a day. He checks his email once a week. I check my snail mail twice a year. So you're already onto this. You, West Coast people are always ahead. <laughs> uh, Marty, Marty is uh, being about as uh, sarcastic as it's possible to be. Both he and I, when we're together, are like this. So yeah, what's up, dude? I have a, a, an important question for you. Sure. Have you ever seen a bald eagle? Yeah. Does All it, the time. Does it actually go? Ah! I don't know. The In call Vermont. Yeah. And you're from New Hampshire. From New Hampshire. How about I've a wolverine? Seen, I've never seen a wolverine. Brown bear? Black bear? You've seen a black bear? I've seen a moose. A moose? But not a brown bear. Not a brown bear. I think that's kind of only Pacific, kind of Northwest. Have you, have you hung out with Bernie? I have. You have? Is he cool? Very cool. Awesome. You don't have to answer this, but what do you think of Medicare for All? <laughs> <laughs> Or you can go back to the brown bear topic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they're related. Feel free. Just say brown bear is your safe word. Brown bear. <laughs> As a public figure, of course, he's going yeah, to worry about I try to stay fired. out of politics. Right? I'm really focused on, I like diplomacy. I like, um, let's see, my shtick is um, I want to focus on global harmony. I want more people to get along, share ideas, irrespective of geographic boundaries. And I know that sounds very challenging, but I mean, we're looking at companies outside of the U.S. to invest in. Some of the top innovation can come out of a place like France, a, a country like France. My That's wife is impossible. French. I've seen a, a wonderful company <laughs> come from come from France. Another company is coming from Ireland. Uh, they're doing a great job in, in promoting innovation. Uh, obviously, there's a shared language, and especially on the East Coast, kind of a shared affinity because of earlier diaspora. But it's very interesting, I mean, to kind of branch outside of where we're at and then look for applications to some of our innovations that are outside the U.S. So speaking of other countries, Detroit, um, you it. actually were responsible for, at least in part, a Motown movie. Tell us about that, because you what? told me on the phone a long time you ago. Stalked right? me. Yeah, love you, Motown. Love Motown. It's real. So you know, we helped find some funding for a for a film back when there was no funding on uh, anywhere because of 2008. I helped my dear friend Mark Davis to uh, to find some funding for his film. It's really cool. So he's like, I mean, like if if we want to meet some Motown folks, which I'm not saying we do, but we do then we have to hit him up. Well, actually, we're on a trajectory right now to maybe be picked up by a major TV network. Major TV show. network. Wow, mm -hmm. that's um, great. I've called uh, Animal Planet mm -hmm. about picking this up, and that's they're right. very interested. I was expecting Oprah. Well, um, that, that's a, a variant of Animal Planet. I don't uh, think we have time for Oprah. <laughs> I mean, we've got Animal Planet and Nat Geo Wild are both very interested. Yes, my agent told me that you hold out for Animal Planet, but if Nat Geo, if we have to settle for Nat Geo Wild, then we'll do it. They're very interesting. I don't think we're going to have to settle. I mean, the person I talked to, which was the company operator, <laughs> said, said that um, there's a process and, and will be considered intern, which I think is very promising. <laughs> well, you, you laugh at this, and yet it's, um, some, it's very important to look at animals uh, that can be a proxy for ourselves. So I heard of something going on now where people will have a mouse that is tested and genotyped to be compatible with us, and then they'll have medicines that are tested on that mouse, and it basically becomes your animal avatar. What? Dude, we're gonna get the PETA people throwing blood on me again. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just the Drosophila that we need to test. Drosophila melanogaster, my- He knows uh, the phylum and species. My, uh, that's my, yeah. that's my uh, uh, biological model that I worked on in college. Wow. I was, I Mine was the Mexican you created hairless this. dog. You created Did you really? This. Mexican Mitchell hairless model. dog. That was your model? No, that was- Is that the I naked mole me. rat? Is that the same thing? Oh, the naked mole rats uh, studied for, I forget what it is. It's actually, it's a- You it's, social behavior. Really? Yeah. So it's uh, it's a very interesting social system under the ground, and I know this because my advisor in undergrad um, predicted and then found the naked mole rat. What, 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 Professor wait, Dick Alexander. Wait, sorry. Back now. Okay, now this this is where the interview starts. <laughs> what? <laughs> so he predicted and found that there would be a an animal um, who would only. Uh, look for other animals when it's time to mate and then never interact with another animal. And he predicted the conditions under which it would have evolved and the conditions where it should live. Turns out that it was Australia. He got some uh, U.S. government funding to go out there in a Land Rover and discover the naked mole rat. Holy crap. Yeah. The most monogamous animal in the entire kingdom, it sounds like. Sounds it. So he predicted an animal from first principles. Yes. 
And now, okay, that gets me this obvious question. What the hell were you studying? What's your PhD in? Uh, so my, uh, no this wonder. was my undergrad work, which was biology, and the PhD is in health economics. Oh, so gotcha. uh, trying to find ways to improve outcomes and reduce costs. It's funny because now everyone knows what that means. But when I first came back from England to the US, they said, in America, Chris, we don't care about costs. So wow, really? I thought I'd be out of work for were a long time. Were you at Cambridge or where were you? I was at Oxford. Uh, he, do you yeah. see how he said the other that? Place. Oh, yeah. He's like, mm, I was at Oxford. What okay. are you? How yeah. dare you, Cambridge? This is. <laughs> <laughs> so you studied this this mole I had a scholarship mole rat. to be there. Yeah. Oh, studying nice. health economics. Did they yeah. like run out of professors and classes? And yeah, they pretty had to, much. Like, That's right. Pizza start. home delivery. <laughs> <laughs> Um, for PhD. No, I studied horses under Dick, though, for a little while, under Dick Alexander at his farm. And what I learned was what works for horses is maximizing rewards and minimizing punishment. Max Lo and behold, Lo like, again, these first principles, it sounds obvious. Everything's obvious on reflection because you should not overlook it. But this is one of those little nuggets of information, a little zinger that, you know, maximize rewards, minimize punishment. It should work for personnel. It should work Works for generally. medical students. <laughs> yeah, yeah, says both of us who are, are known for our pimping of medical students. But, you know, but it's true. So there actually is data in the business world that pointing out flaws in people and their deficiencies, hoping they'll make them better, actually makes it worse. But pointing out bright spots where they're doing well and encouraging them to grow that and try to minimize the, the bad stuff does really well. So you yeah. grow the positive, and it's the same as the positive rewards, the, 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 the carrot versus the stick. Exactly. And, and it's funny that you were joking about Animal Planet, and he has a whole Animal Planet <laughs> background. This guy's like, uh, he's got a part of the animal kingdom right in his brain. I know, right? You like a, King Philip came over from Germany swimming. Swimming, that's right, yes. That's right. Remember that, kingdom fi <laughs> yeah, family, yeah. Everybody's got a little different version of that. <laughs> no, but the, uh, the other thing is that millennials now demand carrots all the time. So there really oh, is a God. general... Here we go. Uh, well, yeah. Did I bring oh, no, up the Don't get me triggered on millennials. No, go, go, please. I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> well, just it's nice to understand the social dynamics of different generations. We have a an aging, rapidly aging population in Vermont. So we're trying to meet those needs while at the same time trying to get more young folks to move to our state. So we're trying to kind of work within two extremes, if you will. Mm. Well, it's interesting because you're perfectly adapted, Chris, to live in Vermont because you they face these very specific challenges and you're yeah. a thoughtful guy who studied this interesting thing. You have a broad, diverse background and you're creative and you're thinking out of the box. This, these are the type of people that go into healthcare in general and we stifle them and we beat them down and yeah. we, we tell them, well, here in America, Chris, we don't think about cost. Yeah. You know, we, we try to sh just squeeze them into a box. And I think that if there's a theme of this, it's that it's time that we took the box back yes. and used it right. Yes. So preserve creativity at all costs and do not be afraid to go out on a limb and innovate. That's kind of what I'd like to say to our audience. I think and it's you're very saying, important. And you're saying we're gonna work on the tools to support that. Because one thing to yeah. say that's another thing to give no support and actually not even carrots, but just sticks. You hey. need a lifeline. So yeah. that's what we're seeing. I mean, we're, we're basically sending out a lifeline for a lot of hungry entrepreneurs, right? Who are frustrated with the system. They feel like their voice is not heard. They've got some fantastic innovations and they just need a little bit of money to get to the next level. Yeah. So I think that's where hospital venture is going to take us. And I think we're going to see more cooperation between hospitals and it's going to be a very valuable thing. And that's why I wanted to suggest Pelu come tomorrow. With mm. his, he's a medical student entrepreneur, yeah. and he's an example. And I hope he's an inspiration to others out there who say, says, hey, the system is broken. We can do better. Here's my idea. And he acts on it. And he connects with somebody like yourself. And good stuff happens. Yeah. And, you know, I hope that can be an encouragement. I'm excited to talk to Pelu tomorrow. I, I am, too. And he was excited uh, when I ran into him last night at the at the party. I was like, dude, he was like, oh, I'm so looking forward to this. I'm like, dude, you already are, like, doing stuff well beyond most people, especially at that age. I want to meet Pelu, and I want to change my name to Pelu. I think that you sounds, know what? Like, really cool. It sounds like it, your name is just Pelu. Like, you know, like the soccer player in um, South America. What was his name? Pella. Pele or Pele. Pele. Yeah, Pele. Yeah, Pele. Pele. Right. Sorry. So that's what I want. I want a single name, you know, Madonna. <laughs> <laughs> but on the carrots and sticks. <laughs> yeah, there's and that. Maybe. On the carrots and sticks. Yeah. We are we as clinicians have to educate all the time. Mm. We educate patients. We yes. educate students. We educate residents. We educate our team. And yet we have no knowledge or training in 
effective education. Oh, just okay. like we. So we come out of school at a residency, and we're supposed to do all this education. We don't know the first thing about education science. We don't have education literacy. Some people do it well. Some people do it horribly. Yeah, right. Just like we are, don't EQ. train. EQ. We don't. Uh, we come out without financial literacy. We come out without uh, relationship literacy, without healthcare literacy, about the business of medicine. It's like the big things that we should be teaching are absent in our traditional educational system. Yeah. And education is co- kind of interesting because somebody came and explained to our to us as residents once. There is a science of what's effective, and you want to complement specifically and give a criticism specifically you want to keep it specific to balance it so normally what we do is we say you did a great job but you should have closed the the abdomen fascia faster yeah so you know what's so funny marty is everything you're saying is the reason i picked stanford for residency because kelly skeff was our program director and he has like a master's in education in addition to being a professor of medicine his whole thing was medical education and he would say and he had he sounds like kind of a jim henson kind of guy he's still around we're still connected and friends yeah. and he's like what, what we want to do is teach the learners how to learn to teach the teachers how to learn. It's true. And, yeah. and and so he would teach us exactly that. And we used to call it, so when we get feedback from Kelly, we called it the Kelly Oreo. So he would come in and he'd be like, well, you're doing wonderful work and your patients love you and it's wonderful. Now, you're a lazy sack of crap that, <laughs> that is already called, you're phoning it in. But what I love about you is you phone it in with pride. It's pride. And so you, you come away going, okay, uh, there's positive there. And there was something yeah. about me being a lazy sack of it. L- maybe I'll work on that. And so it was, it was a Jedi mind trick, right? The Oreo. But it's amazing. Like little tips like that it have taught me when if you have a criticism, like a student could do something better. Yes. Balance it with a specific compliment, not a general compliment, because that'll just go in one ear and out the others. Balance it. So, so specific. You know, specific. So if they could have wrote, written a more um, extensive op note to think, you know, Bob, you did a nice job closing the, the skin. Um, a lot of people struggle with that. You did it very well. That's a really good sign. Mm-hmm. Um, on the op note piece, you could write a more extensive op note. Yes. And they see that as balanced feedback. Sure. And feedback is a science, right? If I would have come and said, like, you're doing a good job, but this op note sucks. Okay, guess what? Then you're just going to feel defensive, paranoid. I failed the rotation. You bring um, up a very important point, which is also that we talked about language earlier. Yeah. And capturing those nuances of language. But most language is nonverbal. And it's how you've communicated something. And so that whole eye contact like we we're having now between doctor and patient, if I'm your patient, I want to see you. I want to see your eyes, not looking down at a computer and so on. So things have to be more natural. And I'd like to see more technologies as a theme in that space. So if I were giving that sort of feedback to Epic, I could say, you know what? I'm really, really, really happy with the name Hyperspace. I think it's catchy. I think it's very tight. The rest of the product could use... <laughs> A lot of work because I'm staring at it instead of at my patient. But you know what I like about it? (laughs) That it's allowed you to buy a really big arena for your own employees that really gets them feeling good. And that's important because your employees should have a culture where they feel safe. Uh, For the one billion dollars we give to the epic company for the ehr mm. congrats on coming up with a good name and, and you know chris is quietly nodding because no hospital representative can they're under all under gag orders they cannot say anything about epic that's probably not true can but you it feels at least right acknowledge epic has room for improvement i i'm just very happy to see electronic health records <laughs> actually you're that's right. really important you are right you are right because the the written the paper stuff Although, although it's they got a cognitive advantage because the way we write is the way yeah. we think. Um, going to electronic is key, but doing it right is going to be key in the future. So, uh, again, people think I'm somehow a luddite. I want to go back to paper. That's not true. So paper maybe for some things like taking notes. Yeah, is actually very helpful. And patients are going to have increased access to their health records uh, by legislative mandate. Right, and they should. They it's should. their record. Absolutely, and We're it's going to be easier to access it. So I feel like that also will make them participants in research that can benefit them. Mar- it also is a, a call to action to understand the whole cybersecurity world and make sure that their information is not misused. But awesome. it's a very interesting kind of theme of, of this yeah. year, 2020, the year of perfect vision. Is that what it's oh, called? Oh, well, it's Who 2020. Came up with that? Probably, uh, I don't know, I'm Obama? <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm just trying to think of somebody. <laughs> it's funny that that just bubbled up. Um, so I think we've done a thing here, you guys, which is uh, we started so talking. Yeah, we started talking about the hospital venture. So the call to action is learn more about that, empower that in your own institution, uh, explore it if you're being creative and you want to do something interesting. We should be supporting. We talked about all the things we should be supporting in terms of creativity, and then we talked about animals, naked mole rats, yes. uh, and my favorite, Drosophila melanogaster. <laughs> And, uh, and 2020 being the year of perfect vision, is that what it's also the year of the nurse? Also the year of the nurse. I'm declaring Great. it the year of the spleen <laughs> or the pancreas. Pancreas is an old dragon, you know. Yeah, yeah, the year of the spleen. I like that. I'm gonna year of the spleen. It's a it's a year to forget the an expendable year. A year to, that's very encouraging. How do you name a generation like Generation X? Like who comes up with that? Is there an international commission? Like can we call it like the year of the gubernaculum? <laughs> Chris like doesn't that. know what the gubernaculum. Do you know what the no, gubernaculum? Okay, so me. the gubernaculum is the little filament I think that is around. The, is it the testes or the epididymis? I forget. But it's literally called the gubernaculum. Okay. And I believe big it's name the, for something relatively modest must. Be, you speak for yourself. Okay. <laughs> Some of us, our gubernaculums are the centerpiece of our identity. <laughs> and uh, do you think they, they the the name the the sort of t term goober came from that? Like, dude, that guy's a total goober. <laughs> <laughs> I think it evolved independently, and they've they've coalesced. That's it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Charles Darwin has a name for that kind of coevolution. It's a convergent, convergent evolution. Convergent that's evolution. What it, that's what that's it is. Right. Yeah. Uh, of course, he would know. He, he would know. Every yeah, exactly. Genus and phylum name in the entire animal kingdom. Yeah, ev bringing evolutionary biology thinking in terms of like fitness landscapes, what works, what doesn't. Like we track things in our ventures world to a high level of data analysis, right? So everything is kind of tracked on a nearly real-time interval and um, that's what happens in nature right we're constantly tested and we fail in nature it's some it's very important to fail fast early but it's also important to embrace failure and i think as a country we do a very good job of taking risk and i hope that continues that i think you nailed what's powerful about america we're willing to take risk we're willing, willing to, to fail. take risk we're will and we, we're empowered to do that by at least some regulatory stuff that allows us to do that yeah. right and and the thing you said about evolutionary biology i think is a good way to, to wrap it up in that medicine is an organism it's an evolving changing organism that actually has to adapt to its surroundings it has to be anti-fragile it has to in other words it needs to get stronger from adversity and develop systems to deal with adversity instead of being so rigid that it resists change until it breaks that's right or so fragile that anything just causes it to crumble like you know like a, a millennial say and we or, hope that we hope that uh uh, corporate strategic venturing from hospitals can be an enzyme and just catalyze the right reactions to bring people together and help foster you know innovations for the Poet, future. Some rapper, genius, nerd. animal scholar, yes. Oxford. Mm -hmm. I mean, were you like a 1600 SAT type of guy? He's like, it was 1599. Yeah. I had a bad okay. day. You missed one. You missed one on the SATs. <laughs> I like this guy. I like him too. He's he's my as 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 uh, as Jabba the Hutt once said. He's my kind of scum. And uh, Chris, I really want to thank you for taking thank the time because you, you had yeah. to trek all the way from the city and interrupt. I all came the, all the way from Vermont. That that's wow. that's what I mean by the city. Yeah, I right. consider Vermont the, the city. Metropolis. Yeah, exactly. Hey, we had a great time in Vermont. UVM yeah. treated us great. Come we back anytime. There. It was awesome. We really Thank enjoyed you being yeah, there. Yeah, all joking aside, that was one of my favorite trips because uh, I came away going, wow, good people in tough situations in a beautiful part of the country with tremendous food and a family-like vibe. They treated us so, so wonderfully. Mm -hmm. And we got to hang out, which was nice because we planned world domination, you know, Pinky and the Brain or <laughs> Dr. Evil and Mini-Me. See that? <laughs> I'm his Mini-Me. Uh, anyways, Chris, thank you again. Have a great rest of your time. How can people reach out to you? What's a good way to contact you or see what you're doing? Just Google me. Uh, I have my email, mobile phone, very accessible. And I have a lot of people that um, want to find me on LinkedIn. That's probably the best way. Chris Jones at University of Vermont. Chris Jones, Vermont. We'll find you on. We'll find uh, me on LinkedIn. Awesome, awesome. That's got a lot of Thank cyber you. holes and security, but I like it. Um, we'll put it on the blockchain next time. All right, Zpack, <laughs> hit share, subscribe to the show. We love you. Review us on iTunes if you're listening to this in a podcast form because we need you to need us. All right, we out. Peace. We out. <laughs>